stories making headlines at this hour. Stepping Stone Mortgage, the Korean government will provide 11 trillion won or roughly 10.3 billion US dollars in financial aid to up to 120,000 households this year in mortgage loans. Now with talks of reunification in the air following a rare round of reunions for Korean war divided families this week, questions remain on the future of inter-Korean ties. We speak to an expert. And nuclear winter, the smog situation in China has gotten so bad that people there are calling it a nuclear winter. Even the World Health Organization has called for immediate action. Primetime News begins now. Good evening and welcome to Primetime News. It's Wednesday, February 26th here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gonyo. And I'm Sean Lim. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin with the president's drive to boost domestic demand by relieving the burden of housing costs on the nation's middle class. Authorities hope the measures will also boost the sluggish housing market. Arirang News' Song Ji-sun has our top story. Balancing record-breaking exports with greater domestic activities is a key economic objective of President Park Geun-hye's three-year plan. And as the first concrete step toward boosting domestic demand, the government has put together a detailed plan to reinvigorate the housing market. Finance Minister Hyun Suk told a meeting of economy-related ministers on Wednesday that there is an urgent need to stabilize skyrocketing housing rent fees to allow consumers to spend more on other things. To control prices in Korea's traditional rental system called Jeonse, the government will make sure some 500,000 new homes will be built over the next three years. The government will also offer low interest loans totaling 11 trillion won or 10 billion US dollars to new home buyers to ease their burden. It will also draw up tailored plans for people seeking to rent their home on a monthly basis. Wednesday's move came one day after President Park unveiled a three year plan aimed at overhauling the Korean economy into a vibrant trendsetter from a fast follower. And to rein in the household debt issue, Seoul aims to lower households' disposable income to debt ratio by 5 percentage points by 2017. The finance ministry also said it would raise household income by creating new jobs, particularly for women and young people. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. And speaking of the local economy, boosting exports and increasing domestic demand are the two staples of the Park Geun-hye administration's drive to protect the domestic economy from external shocks. Our National Assembly correspondent Ji Myung Gil has more on the trade minister's meeting before lawmakers to explain the plan. In an annual policy report to the Parliamentary Trade Committee on Wednesday, Trade Minister Yoon Sang-jik promised to support small and medium-sized companies seeking to boost their export volume. To help SMEs boost exports, we will increase the size of our trade finance program to more than 72 billion U.S. dollars this year from 69 billion last year. Yoon said the minister will aim to lift Korea's total export volume to over $600 billion this year, up from a record high of nearly $560 billion in 2013. The ministry will also seek to increase domestic demand in order to reduce the country's reliance on exports, making the Korean economy less susceptible to the ups and downs of global markets. The government also plans to reform the country's regulatory system over the next three years to remove excess red tape and bolster sluggish corporate investment. The ministry will review the current economic regulations from the ground up with the idea of removing the excess. We will also try to prevent the regulatory system from becoming overly complex. To promote trade relations, the government will seek to conclude pending bilateral free trade agreements with China, Canada, Australia and New Zealand as soon as possible. 
Lawmakers on the Trade Committee urged the government to be thorough in its assessment of what Korea has to gain and lose from the trade pacts. Implementation of the trade deals is expected to expand Korea's trade territory from 55 percent of the global market to 71 percent. Kim young Arirang News. And speaking of efforts by Korean companies to boost their presence abroad, more are investing in the U.S. state of California and specifically in Los Angeles. Our Hwang Ji-hye takes a look at how the link-ups between firms here and in L.A. is giving the City of Angels a boost. A number of trucks are pouring concrete into a hole, the site of the future Wilshire Grand, a 73-story skyscraper packed with offices, retail outlets, and hotel rooms. When it opens in 2017, it will be the tallest building in the city, the eighth tallest in the United States, and the first major skyscraper built in the city in more than 20 years. The company behind the project is Hanjin Group, the Korean shipping and airline giant. It symbolizes Korea's commitment to the region. It shows the energy and excitement that is emerging in downtown LA. LA Mayor Eric Garcetti says the building has already given the local economy a boost. It's a $1 billion investment in Los Angeles, creating 11,500 construction jobs. But we will have 1,750 permanent jobs when they finish their work as well. So I thank everybody who brought this day together. And many other Korean companies like Samsung, Hyundai and CJ are also taking part in boosting LA's local economy. According to a report by the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, Korea is ranked as one of the top sources of foreign investment in LA County. California United Terminals, a subsidiary of Hyundai Merchant Marine that operates out of the port of Los Angeles, has plans to develop a new terminal and it has already invested tens of millions of dollars in the area. We made direct investment in the equipment needed and the exact amount will exceed 100 million U.S. dollars. Ferdinando Guerra, an economist at the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, says the free trade agreement between Korea and the U.S. is allowing even more Korean capital to flow into the city. Increased two-way trade. As a result of that, we will also see an increase in foreign direct investment, uh, particularly, you know, obviously going both ways. Barriers to investments remain, but Guerra says he expects Korean companies to pump even more money into the local economy in the coming years, given the area's huge Korean-American consumer base. Hwang Ji, Arirang News, Los Angeles. The government ministry in charge of matters related to reunification with North Korea supports President Bakunin's plans to launch a preparatory committee with the same goal. Unification Ministry spokesman Kim Yi-do on said on Wednesday that the functions of the committee and the ministry will not overlap. Kim elaborated on the president's plan, explaining that the committee would be brainstorming for ways to unify the Korean Peninsula and prepare accordingly while coming up with ways to integrate the policies and the people of the two Koreas. President Park announced plans to launch a preparatory committee for reunification on Tuesday in a nationally televised news conference. Now, President Park Geun-hye has vowed to map out a fresh path to Korean reunification and to take an in-depth look into President Park's North Korea policy. We're joined in the studio by Dr. Pong Young-sik, Senior Research Fellow at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Welcome. Good evening. Now, uh, the recent inter-Korean family reunions pretty much, you know, um, concluded without much hiccup, despite the fact that South Korea-U.S. Uh, joint military drills are currently underway. Now, are we seeing a warming up of cross-border relations? Yes, we do. I think after the successful completion of the family reunion event, uh, two things, two positive uh, events are likely to take place. One, inter-Korean relations. Uh, will uh, be gradually improved, at least in the short run. And two, there will be growing public support uh, inside South Korea for Park geun administration's North Korea policy, uh, dubbed as a trust-building process. Uh, the reason why I say that is that 
North Korea is different uh, from it was last year. This time last year, North Korea was vehemently testing the resolve of the Park Geun-hye administration with very vitriolic uh, rhetoric and the very belligerent provocations. But uh, to her credit, President Park Geun-hye uh, did not budge, uh, did not deviate from the uh, trust building process based upon principles. And this time, North Korea has been really aggressive in making the family reunion event uh, to uh, take place. Well, time is running out for many of the surviving family members who have been separated. Do you think that we will see more reunions happen in the future? Do you think it will become a regular event? Unfortunately, I should say that the chances are low for the family reunion to become a regular event. Uh, South Korean uh, government has persistently uh, you know, requested North Korean government to make the event uh, regularized and more frequent and allow the individual to verify uh, the life and death of separate family members and uh, facilitate the exchange of letters between separate family members. But there is no sign that North Korea's attitude with regard to uh, these three requests uh, has changed. So time is running out. Now, however, despite all these uh, humanitarian events going on, it seems like um, the cross-border relations on the Korean Peninsula can only happen if you know, North Korea denuclearizes. Now, how can uh, the South Korean government um, move in order to achieve that? The key word for Park Geun-hye administration uh, to succeed in denuclearization effort is harmony. Park Geun-hye administration uh, needs to keep two goals in harmony. The first goal is, of course, uh, moving ahead uh, for the denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. But two, the other goal is to maintaining momentum of inter-Korean reconciliation that just took place. Because there is a danger that North Korea may be uh, tempted to uh, use um, uh, its bargaining uh, leverage on South Korea by dangling inter-Korean reconciliation uh, against the new denuclearization. Well, North Korea is dealing with a foot and mouth disease outbreak, and South Korea has offered aid, but we've yet to hear back from North Korea. And Pyongyang today actually asked the UN for help. How should we interpret this non response? Well, it is uh, too early to say anything uh, definite about North Korea's intention and likely respond. But regardless of North Korea's uh, response. I would say that Park Geun-hye administration uh, seems to be determined to encourage uh, provision of humanitarian aid to North Korea. All right. Well, Professor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. To strengthen regulations on protecting personal information following a massive data leak by credit card companies here in Korea last month, a new privacy protection bill is moving through the National Assembly. The bill passed Wednesday by the Security and Public Administration Standing Committee would require financial institutions and other public companies to use encrypted passwords to protect social security numbers. The bill will now be sent to the Judiciary Committee and then to the full assembly for a final vote. Now, this comes after police in the city of Incheon arrested 10 people on Wednesday on charges of hacking more than 200 websites and selling the personal data of 1.7 million people. Air pollution in Beijing has reached dangerous levels, prompting the World Health Organization to call it a crisis and call for immediate action. The toxic heavy smog has been choking the Chinese capital for the past week or so. Connie Lee reports on the environmental catastrophe. You can barely see it, but the city of Beijing is there under a thick blanket of smog. It's the sixth day in a row of hazardous pollution in the city, and now the World Health Organization has called Chinese smog a crisis. We are very concerned and we have to see this as a crisis. A crisis means that we need to take immediate action to protect ourselves. 
Chinese environmental inspection teams have been dispatched to 12 factories nationwide, and there are reports that authorities have shut down or fined certain factories for not following pollution regulations. Pollution levels in Beijing are above 450 on an air quality index. That's nine times the level deemed safe for humans. Beijing has been under an orange alert since Monday, the city's second highest warning level. Residents are being asked to wear masks or stay indoors, and hospitals are reportedly crowded with patients suffering from respiratory problems. Children and older citizens are more susceptible to breathing problems, and the smog makes people cough a lot too. If and when the pollution alert reaches the highest warning level, drivers will only be allowed on the road on alternate days based on their license plate numbers, and schools will be shut down. Meanwhile, meteorologists say that cold air coming from the north is expected to decrease smog levels in China starting Wednesday night, which could, in turn, also lessen the fine dust and smog coming into Korea. Connie Lee, Arirang News. It's the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's Culture Day here in Korea. From free admissions to museums to discount tickets, there's guaranteed to be something for everyone to enjoy. Our cultural correspondent Park Ji-won reports on how the day is even fit for the president. At Seoul Arts Center on Wednesday, Korea's representative performing arts venue. Hundreds of people gathered for a free concert as part of the government-led monthly culture day. The concert tickets were distributed for free online, and in just three hours, all 440 tickets were booked. It really reflects a great level of interest towards the program. We once again realize there is a high demand for culture from all walks of life. So we will keep coming up with good programs to meet the demand. I came here because my sister got tickets. It is awesome that we can listen to classical music on a regular basis with commentary that makes classical music easier to understand. It was also great to meet these very talented musicians. It is just one of many cultural performances or exhibitions provided for free or at a discount on this culture day across the country, the second ever. President Park Geun-hye was among those taking part. She watched an original Korean musical in support of the government initiative. The first culture day in January was considered a success, and even more cultural institutions have joined in on the government initiative this month. Last month, 883 cultural institutions participated in the Culture Day initiative. This month, more than 200 other institutions notified us about their intention to join in the Culture Day. That means more than 8,000 institutions are participating and providing more cultural benefits for the people. Discounts on movie tickets are also being offered at three major movie chains, CGV, Lotte and Megabox on Wednesday evening, while major entertainment companies like CJ, ENM and PMC Production are providing discounts of up to 50 percent to its musicals. From this month on, tickets to sporting events will also be marked down on culture days. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. From a death sentence for dozens of terrorists in Egypt to Ukraine, which is seeking to send its ousted president to the International Criminal Court, let's get a check on the headlines from around the world. Our UDN is standing by at the News Center. Liana, let's begin with the latest out of Egypt. Hi guys, an Egyptian court has sentenced 26 people to death for forming a terrorist group and plotting attacks on ships passing through the Suez Canal. Cairo criminal court judges said the men were also accused of manufacturing missiles and explosives. All of the 26 defendants, except for one, were tried in absentia. The sentencing comes a day after new Prime Minister Ibrahim Malab vowed to, quote, crush terrorism in all corners of the country. In Ukraine, the parliament has voted to send ousted President Viktor Yanukovych, whose whereabouts are still unknown, to the International Criminal Court over the deaths of more than 100 anti-government protesters. Earlier this week, Yanukovych was indicted by the interim government for mass murder. Those who held posts in law enforcement structure, those who gave orders, 
and those who executed those orders, all of them will be punished. All of them will be punished. We will not forget that. Now, there's rising concern about separatism between a pro-Russia East and a pro-European Union West after the formation of a unity government was delayed to Thursday. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and British Foreign Secretary William Haig have expressed hope that Ukraine can form an inclusive government. Korea wasn't the only nation victimized by the Japanese military during World War II. Over 39,000 Chinese nationals were forced to work in Japanese companies during the war, and over 6,000 died in the process. Seeking justice some 70 years later, the victims that survived and the families of those that didn't, 37 people in all, filed a class action lawsuit against 17 of the Japanese corporations on Wednesday. It represents the first case in a Chinese court over the matter it can potentially increase tensions between Beijing and Tokyo even further. The plaintiffs are demanding that the Japanese firms apologize in writing for the compulsory labor and are asking for about 160,000 U.S. dollars per person in compensation. That's all for me for this evening and I'll be back tomorrow night for another look at all the stories making headlines around the world. Hello and welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm Stephen Che. Now let's start off in Palm Beach, Florida, where what many consider the unofficial start of the PGA Tour season, the Honda Classic, is set to open. All the top golfers in the world will be there, including Tiger Woods, Adam Scott, Rory McIlroy, Phil Mickelson, and many others. Also down in sunny Palm Beach will be defending champion Michael Thompson, who started off 2014 with three top 20 finishes already. Experts are divided on who might win, but many have tagged Graham McDowell to take home the trophy. He's cracked the top 10 in the Honda Classic in each of the last three seasons. The Honda Classic tees off on Thursday morning, local time. And moving on to the UEFA Champions League, the Greek giants Olympiakos stunned an unspirited Manchester United 2-0 in their first leg matchup. Now it heads to Old Trafford on March 19th, with Olympiacos primed to reach the quarterfinals. In the earlier match, Dortmund trampled Zenit 4-2 as striker Robert Lewandowski nets two goals to seal the win. Meanwhile, later on, the remaining first leg matches will be held. Galatasaray takes on Chelsea, while Schalke meets Real Madrid. And coming back to Korea, the 95th annual National Winter Sports Festival opened on Wednesday in Pyeongchang, the site of the next Winter Olympics. Running until Saturday, athletes from around the country will compete in speed skating, short track, figure skating and other winter sports. Now let's get to Wednesday's top matches starting in the KBL. In the first game, SK dominated KCC 71 to 54, but now let's Talk about the game of the night between the LG Sakers and the Tongbu Promi. Now Tongbu gets the early lead, but LG gets hot and goes up into the half, up seven points. Now Tongbu behind Kim Juzong makes their run, but they're no match for LG's combo of Davon Jefferson and Kim Jong-gyu. And LG edges out the win 74-73. Now it's the V-League. Korean volleyball's best team Samsung Hwaje took on LIG Insurance in Kumi. Now Samsung takes the first set with fine form and continues to dominate the second set as well. LG can't stop Samsung and Leo Martinez who close out the third set easily and they win in straight sets for their 21st of the season. And that's all I have for now. This has been Stephen Che. I'll see you after midnight for more from the world of sports.
It was a warm spring-like day here in Korea, but most of us were hesitant to spend much time outside because of the high levels of toxic dust. For more, let's turn things over to our Kim Bo-kyung. Bo well, guys, um, even though temperatures rose all the way to 15 degrees here in the capital today, many were hesitant to go outside, um, as you would expect. As you can see, the fine dust levels dropped to 80 micrograms per cubic meter here in the capital a couple of hours ago. However, we're not out of the woods yet because it could rise back up at any time. But it's a relief that the southern regions have, wa uh, the showers that is, down south, have washed away some of that toxic particles. And currently, the the southern regions are under the influence of a low pressure trough, which is why it is raining there. Through tomorrow, Jeju and Gyeongsangnam-do province will get 20 to 60 millimeters of precipitation. The central regions will be stuck with the fine dust for a while because there's no rain forecast there anytime soon. Well, tomorrow looks to be another warm winter day. Seoul starts off the day at 4 degrees with a high of 13. Meanwhile, cities down south hit the low teens. Moving on to other regions, Daejeon and Jeju also make it to the mid-teens while Dokdo tops out at 9. Guys. Well, thank you, Pogan, for that. And that is our broadcast on this Wednesday night. I'm Moon Ga Young in Seoul. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.